at four o'clock. Holly, if you're ready to go. I am. Um, looks like I am no longer co-host. So if Kathy or um, Rob, if you could make me a co-host, that would be fantastic. So I can share my screen because I have a lot of really exciting things to share with you today. All right, here we go. So I'm going to share with you. Okay. I know it looks exactly the same, <laughs> but here we are. So welcome everybody. So we'll start scooching ahead here. All right. So we'll go over some housekeeping bits of information uh, before we get started. Um, Kathy, would you like to, to handle some of this? I What's certainly it? would. So Perfect. as you as you keep signing in everyone, again, thank you for joining us this afternoon. It's afternoon on the East Coast. Um, and uh, afternoon everywhere, I think, pretty much at this point. Um, so just a couple, you know, housekeeping items. Um, after the webinar, you will receive an email with a uh, link for your professional development certificate. Um, and as you see on the screen, it'll give the date and the time um, and seasonal science spring. Um, so expect that in 24 to 48 hours by early next week. Um, the email that you registered with is where it will be sent to. So just check that email. Um, if you don't receive one, you can always reach out to us. Um, give it a few days um, to get to you. Um, uh, this is a webinar, webinar format, um, and we are a very large group today. <laughs> so um, you can pose your questions, but put them in the Q&A box. And our great team of Marilyn and Terry and Rob will be right behind, the, are behind the scenes and they will answer your questions as they come across their screens. Um, during the webinar, there will be several polls um, that Holly is gonna get some information from you. So uh, have your uh, devices ready, um, your telephone, your laptop, your iPad, whatever you're using um, and participate in the polls because that really gives us some really fun information. And as Holly mentioned, this is being recorded and you will receive not only recording, but also the resources um, and the book recommendations that Holly will be sharing this afternoon. And always you can look to shopbecker.com and look for today's uh, workshop as well as the previous science ones and as well as Holly's other uh, workshops, the kitchen science. So that being said, let's talk about Holly for a minute. So, um, so Holly, uh, so, so those of you who have joined us before, you are now amazingly fond of Holly and all, all her science. Oh, no. <laughs> um, Holly has, I think, uh, some groupies now as well. Um, so Holly is a certified K-8 elementary uh, school teacher. Um, as you can see by her photos, she loves animals, um, all kinds of animals. So she has worked at the Academy of Natural Sciences right here in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, um, for 15 years. And she is a reading specialist with Achieve Now, which is a Philadelphia nonprofit that provides literacy support for public school children in grades K through three. So any new highlights you want to give us, Holly, about your scientific adventures maybe through the winter? Oh, well, uh, I mean, winter's, winter's a tough time for, for outdoor natural science. So I'm excited as we move into spring and I've got some special guests to share with you on our, on our webinar here today. <laughs> All right, Holly's <laughs> guests and my idea of guests are not the same, but that's okay. She's trying to convert. They're definitely a guest, whether or not you think they're special, I guess, is where there we differ. Go. All right. I am going to go behind scenes and Holly, please take us on a great adventure today. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Kathy. I am so excited to be back. Spring is my absolute favorite time to be talking about science because it means we can go outside and explore the natural, natural, natural world. <laughs> so here we go. Before I get started, this is the sort of standards alignment sheet that I put up every session that I do. 
Um, I'm not going to read them to you. I just want you to know that that uh, everything we're talking about today is aligned with sort of the the um, uh, PA early learning standards, the Eckerd standards, Head Start standards. What's so great about science standards in um, uh, early education is that they're the perfect level of broad. <laughs> so um, there it's actually perfect for early learners. So um, we're going to spend a lot of time on skill development. And you'll see that uh, reflected in the standards a lot. All right. So here's my so my quick science for littles. If you've been before, you've seen this slide, I'm going to go through it very, very quickly. Um, like I mentioned, skills and loving science is really what we're looking at here. We're not going to spend a lot of time with specific um, content knowledge acquisition because that's not what it should be about when they're little. Because uh, little uh, young learners are the best scientists. They are already using their senses to explore. They're already little sponges. And that's what we want from our future scientists. So the things we're really going to focus on are two main skills, making observations, huge, using their senses. Unfortunately, once they get to elementary school, we stop focusing on using those senses. So in, L in, um, early, L um, in early education, if we spend our time really honing in on those skills of using our senses to understand the world around us, we'll have better scientists come up through the grades. And then asking questions. We all know preschoolers can ask questions. That is their jam. They do it all day long. And science is the perfect place to foster those questions. There's lots of other things that come along with uh, science and early learning. You can see them there. They're the ones we're, we're sort of more familiar with um, as far as science skills, you know, cause and effect, following directions, those sorts of things. But really, it's that asking questions and uh, making observations that are the really sort of key points uh, in um, our, our early uh, learners' science skills. All right, so here's our first poll. I want to know from all of you, how often do you go outside for science lessons? And I'm not talking necessarily just recess, but it can be part of recess. Um, do you go outside and um, are you doing science lessons out there or is it just sort of free time? So give me a sense of how you're using your outdoor spaces at your, um, at your different locations. All right, while those are coming in, I'm going to scooch forward a little bit. So I, I'm really curious to see what sorts of outdoor spaces you might be using. Um, so we're going to start with more naturey outdoors, but then we will spend a little bit more time on more urban and suburban settings. So I, I, I will go into that as well. So some general outdoor learning tips, especially if you're getting at, into parks or you're going for mini hikes, those sorts of things. Um, if you're taking small children out into the great outdoors, whatever that means, whatever the great outdoors looks like, the important thing is you know what you're getting into. Visit the spaces first. Um, that way you'll know where there are potential things that, that might um, either distract your students or encourage them off of the beaten path. So make sure you're very familiar so that you can spend your time teaching and learning um, and not so much making sure everybody's safe. Um, and oh, I just I got the I got the uh, results. Okay, good news is everybody is spending some time outside. <laughs> okay, so whether we're spending outside um, a lot exploring nature, or we're just starting to get out there to do a little bit of uh, nature explorations with our students, I'm glad to see we are spending some time outside. Um, a lot of these are um, sort of pretty obvious things, but I like to say them out loud because sometimes they get lost in the mix when we're getting set to take our students outside, especially if in an unfamiliar outside of the playground uh, situation. Of course, always dress for the weather. Give your parents lots of advance warning if you're going to be leaving the playground um, and bring water with you. All right, so let's see. Now during your visit, this is where it gets fun. The thing that I like to remind all educators when they're taking their students outside, um, it's very simple and it's easy to overlook. When you're teaching your students, 
pay attention to where the sun is. <laughs> Because if the sun is um, directly behind you, your students are not going to be able to see you. And it sounds like a very simple thing, but I want everyone to sort of have it in their brain as they're taking their students out so uh, that your students are able to see you much better. Um, another really important sort of highlight from this section here uh, is that if you're looking under logs and rocks, and you should be looking under logs and rocks, we're going to spend some time talking about creepy crawlies today. And I, and I, I know some people already are getting a little tense thinking about those creepy crawlies, but I'm hoping by the end of the day, you'll be, uh, you'll be a little more comfortable with our six, eight, or even more legged friends. Um, but I do want to say if you are flipping over rocks and um, logs while you're exploring with your students, always flip the log or rock um, sort of away from you. You don't want to surprise what might be living under that rock and you want to give them the opportunity to run away from you and not run towards you. I spent a lot of time taking kids out in nature and that's really sort of the, the, the biggest highlight that I want everyone to take with them today. And then finally afterwards you should always wash your hands and let parents know to do a sort of a bug bite check at home. Um, it's, it's just an important thing and something they should uh, get used to doing once they've spent time in the outdoors. Now, if you are not lucky enough to be able to take your students to a place where there is hiking and paths and nature abounds, um, there are ways to find nature in more urban and suburban uh, locales. So there, there's two places you can look. You can look up and you can look down. All right, so um, when you're looking up, birds, bugs, clouds, birds, bugs, clouds. Though we, we they tend to be around all the time, so we, we tend not to think about them as, as observing or, or enjoying nature. Um, but that's the best way to get kids thinking about their natural world and their place in that natural world. And you can do some things to encourage animals to come to your, um, your less than natural space. So I want to show you one here. You can see on the, on the right there, we have that kitchen whisk. So I've sort of made one here. So you you can probably see on my little camera here. I've, I've made my own little uh, uh, kitchen whisk nesting materials. So what will happen is birds will take all of these little materials out of my um, whisk here and they'll use it to help them build their nests. Now is the time to put these out. Now the one that I showed you in the picture had, um, it had like dog hair and dryer lint and all of those sort of natural looking colors um, inside them. I like to fill it with a sort of brighter colors because then you have the fun of when you go on a walk around your neighborhood or around the block, you'll see these colors in birds nests. And that is a really, really fun way to, to see how the animals are using the materials you've left out for them. You can just hang this anywhere um, in your schoolyard and make sure to come back to it um, uh, every couple of days or every couple of weeks to see what's been taken from your whisk. Now, if you're using string that's like really fuzzy like this, all you need to do is take a brush and brush out that fuzzy string and it'll make it nice and loose for birds to be able to pull it. You see, I've got tool here, I've got string, I even have a little bit of leaves there. So um, it, it's, a, it's an easy way to bring um, birds and uh, other animals that will sort of take those things like Mice will take them, rats will take them, um, and they'll use it in their homes and, and, and it'll make a nice cozy place for all of the, uh, the baby animals to live. All right, so if we're looking up, we also definitely want to look down. So let me go back to sharing. All right. Now, I don't know how many of you have space in your um, uh, playground to Build, we've got this beautiful little uh, tire garden outside. Um, if you have that opportunity, go for it. Even if you're in a space that doesn't have a lot of bugs, you start planting things, you'll have a lot of visiting bugs, which are a great time, or, which are a great opportunity for students to observe living creatures because generally our students are a little too loud for other animals to stick around. We don't often get to observe other animals when we've got our little kids because they're just simply too loud and other animals are like, no, thank you. But bugs, bugs who, bur who burrow into the ground, You'll be able to observe a lot of them if you start planning things in your um, your your outdoor spaces. Now, this is something I'm I'm going to I'm going to come back to several times over the course of today, and that is um, 
I know that being scared of spiders and bugs and, and creepy crawlies and even um, other animals might be something you're experiencing. And some of your students will experience it too. And uh, when I was in, um, uh, when I worked with live animals and we were out in the wild, we would always talk about respecting the animals. You don't need to love them and you certainly don't wanna cuddle them because they're wild animals. But as long as we respect them and we observe them with our eyes and our ears, we can learn a lot about them. You can see pretty far away from animals and still learn a lot about them. So we're always gonna be talking about respecting the animals that we encounter um, and, and, and of course the plants too. We're gonna to talk a little bit more about plants in a little bit. All right, so I wanna show you um, a quick DIY um, uh, tool you can bring out into the wild with you. So when you're going to play outside, this works well for um, like true nature hiking as well as um, if you're using it in your, uh, like, a, like an urban or a city setting. So I'm gonna show you some, some really quick ways, really quick tools you can make on your own to, uh, uh, encourage your students to look a little bit more, a little bit cl more closely at the world around them. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to flip over to my camera again. All right, so you may have seen in that picture that I had one of these. All it is is a simple mat frame. Um, you would use it to, you know, surround a picture to, to, to make it fit inside a, a different uh, size frame. So what I do is I take those frames and I cover them with different things for uh, the students to look for. So for example, you can do, you know, leaf shapes here. So I've got all different leaf shapes. You can change it up and have them look for actually specific leaves. You can use the actual leaves. You can glue those right on the outside. You can um, draw them. You can use photographs, print it off the internet. Super easy. You're, you can make them as pretty or as utilitarian as you would like. Um, but another thing that you can do with these particular things, so I've covered it in um, contact paper. So the idea is that the student would take this and they would use it and they would look around through this, this viewer. It's gonna help them to focus to see to, to focus their observations and what they can do so what i have here is oops, i picked yellow Ugh, yellow um i have the wet erase markers you can use dry erase markers with these um but if the student is using it outside and they're holding it they might wipe off all their hard work so the idea is if they find a leaf they can put an x they can circle it and then you can reuse these with other students. You can just, you know, take a, a, a baby wipe or a, a slightly wet paper towel to them and you can um, uh, uh, use them again. So another one of my favorites, and if you were with me for um, our fall uh, uh, webinar, I love using paint swatches because here's the problem with color matching in the wild. You can give your students a rainbow to match. But they're gonna have to be really hard pressed to find these exact colors. Okay. Um, it's just that's not the colors that we'll find in nature in most places where we live. So, what I like to do is, of course, depending on the season, you might wanna change these colors. I like to take the paint um, swatches. Um, and so you can get different shades of browns. So I've got browns and I've got tans here. So when the student takes this out, it's easier for them to compare these colors um, with the things that they would find um, in nature. So I, I, I love to do this. And again, I've covered it with the contact paper and I'm able to uh, draw on it or color on it. They can keep track of things. Um, and here's my absolute favorite one. This one is just an I wonder. I, I, it may be backwards for you. I apologize if it's backwards for you, but it just says I wonder across the top. Now, my son helped me decorate this one. He was, he was very happy to, uh, to share his artistic skills with you today. And this is uh, what I call an I wonder frame. So anytime they, they see something that sparks their curiosity or they have a question about, they can frame it with this picture here. Oh, it's not backwards. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the heads up. All right. So um, what I'm hold on, I, I, I'm going to check my volume settings really quick. It looks like maybe I'm a little quiet. So I'm going to try to try to scooch that up a little bit. And hopefully you're able to hear me a little bit better now. All right. 
So um, this is a great one to uh, encourage students to ask questions. Remember, we we're talking about observations and we we're talking about questions. This is a great one for uh, using those questions. And finally, now, if you've been with me before, you know I absolutely love these things. So what I have here is one of those just dry erase, uh, dry erase pockets. Okay, so um, there you can you put anything inside of them. You can take things in and out. But I like to use this one because they're really clear. If you were to cover the front with contact paper, it would look a little muddy. But what I love about this is that when you um, when a student uses these and they find, say, a leaf, oh, you can see my my right there. They can put it on top of the leaf and then just trace what they see underneath. And again, if you're using those here, there we go. So I've traced my leaf and now I've got an image of what I saw out on the walk. And this is a super simple way. If you use the, the wet erase markers, um, they'll very easily uh, wash off, but they won't wipe off before the, the students have had a chance to share with you um, what they've traced. I love the idea of a nature tracer. Um, it's a really great way to, again, focus those uh, observation skills when you're walking through uh, you know, the wilds, even if the wilds are just your own backyard. All right, let me go back to sharing. So some of these I've, I've already shared with you, just a list of suggestions. This activity is one of the ones that is included in um, sort of the write-up for this web uh, webinar. So you'll, you'll have this list and other suggestions on how to make these and how to use them when you take your students out. So there's some of them here. And you'll notice that some of them are um, content specific. So if you wanna do leaf idea, if you wanna do cloud viewers, hold on, I, I didn't actually show you my little cloud viewer here. This, this was this was one of the first ones I ever made. Basically, you can have your your kiddos uh, laying on their backs in the um, uh, uh, in the playground. They can use those cloud viewers to help them frame different types of clouds. And there's uh, images there they can compare them to. You can use content, or you can have more skills based, like the tracer or the I wonder. Uh, frame. They're very, very flexible. Make a bunch of them and use them um, with your students at any season. Spring's fun because we can spend more time outside, but really we can use them for any season. All right, so I want to know, is this something that you want to use? Because as we move forward and do more trainings like this, I want to make sure that um, I'm speaking to the, the, the types of um, projects and ideas that uh, you'd like to use in your own classroom. So you go ahead and fill that out and we'll keep moving along. All right, books. Oh, I love books. So STEM and science is, is my first love, but, but books are a really close second. So I do like to spend a little bit of time on um, uh, the types of books you can use during a spring session. Um, if you have ones that you wanna share with the group, definitely put those in the chat. Uh, if, if there are not ones that I am, I'm aware of, I always go back and look to make sure that I haven't missed a really exciting spring book or fall book or winter book. So um, if you've been to these uh, webinars before, you've seen this particular slide. Um, nonfiction books are fantastic. I love them. They're great. They're terrible for story time. It is very rare that I find a nonfiction factual book that's good to share with a whole class and um, uh, make it uh, make the, the content exciting enough for a read aloud. So nonfiction books, I like to see those in your science centers. I like to see those sent home to parents. If you've got a book sharing um, set up in your classroom, send them home because the parents love talking about them and they've got the time to sort of pour through them very, very carefully. So send them home, put them in your science center. Um, Offer students the ability to, to, to mark up the books. Now we don't want them writing in our books, but having things like post-it notes or even more of um, these types of things where they can trace things inside their nonfiction books without actually drawing on the book. Um, more ways for them to interact with the stories beyond act the actual printed word in them is really important. Um, and as far as the ones to choose, I always say, the books written for older students are actually 
much better than the books written for younger students generally. Don't be afraid to put those those books that are way above your 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 children's sort of comprehension and, and reading level in your science center because often they've got the best diagrams, they've got the coolest pictures. Um, you want to be looking for books with lots of pictures, lots of diagrams, and here are some really, really great ones. These are some of my favorite nonfiction books. Now you'll notice on some of these slides there's little like bees in the corner. Those are just a little handy reference guide. Those are ones that are are available through um, Becker School Supplies. So definitely check those out on their website and we'll have a sort of more information about that at the end. All right. Oh, I just got some. Oh, you like them. We like the nature viewers. Fantastic. I'm glad to hear it. So um, these are all great books to use for throughout spring. You'll see some um, very uh, common themes, lots of bugs, lots of animals. Because um, again, th those are the things that are that are really, really exciting when it comes to springtime. Um, you'll notice that there are some, is some rain and um, water cycle stuff, which of course you can do during spring. Just as a heads up, I'm gonna be focusing more on water and the um, water cycle in my summer webinar. So sit tight for some more cool water activities. Um, but I wanted to highlight these three books here at the bottom. We've got We Dig Worms, A Seed is Sleepy, and Some Bugs. I love these books. And I've included pictures of, of why I love these books so much. Um, you can see the Blue Dig Worms has this awesome internal diagram of a worm. These are great conversation starters. And Some Bugs, this is absolutely one of my favorite books, hands down, all year long uh, is some bugs. And it's also because of this last page here. We've got all these really great, now they're not scientifically accurate. That's okay. <laughs> We're not worried about that. We're not worried about that at all. We want them to be excited about the idea of learning more about these bugs. So um, this, is, this is absolutely one of my favorite books. And we can see we also have another really cool growth diagram here. So those are the types of things you wanna be looking for. You wanna include ones that have photos as well as ones that are sort of illustrated or, or, or diagrams. All right, <clears throat> my favorite part. I want to know if you have ever willingly or knowingly brought bugs into your classroom. Now, this could be um, as something as simple as work. You know, we catch roly polies and we we bring them into the classroom and we let them go afterwards. Or it could be, and probably more commonly butterflies. If you raise butterflies, that's the type of thing that I want to know, because we're going to talk a little bit about raising butterflies, some alternate bugs um, that you can bring into your classroom, especially during the spring, um, and uh, sort of the care and keeping of them and how to make the, the best use of, of live critters in your classroom beyond the live critters you take care of every day. All right, <clears throat> so why have the live animals in the classroom? So if we look back at those standards, Living and non-living, huge piece of the early childhood curriculum. And um, there's lots of ways to do that without actually bringing a live animal into your classroom. But, um, you know, I, I don't know how many of you grew up and had, you know, class pets in your classes. And we, we see that less and less now. Some of you may have class pets in your, in, in your um, particular classrooms. But some of the advantages to having live animals is, you know, you get to experience sort of the biodiversity of the world. Um, you can bond with the critters and, you know, it, it, it sets up those positive, respectful attitudes with live animals. Of course, beyond sort of the, you know, chore chart check mark, which I'm sure is how we, you know, most of us interacted with class pets when we were younger, was sort of that chore chart where who, who, who had to feed and who had to water, that sort of thing. Um, but it goes much, much more beyond that. Now, if you, if you want to have a live animal in your classroom, but you can't for lots of reasons, many times you're just not permitted to because of, of the um, potential allergies and, and things like that. So bugs might be a good sort of substitute for things like a rabbit or, you know, a guinea pig or birds or any of those sorts of things. Um, you know, if you don't have a lot of budget to take care of an animal, a lot of space or a lot of time, bugs can be a really um, a good choice for your classroom to expose your students to, to live animals. And, and have like those really close personal relationships. Um, if you want to observe life cycles, you're not, you, trust me, you don't want to observe life cycles with bunnies because that's just, just too many bunnies. Um, but if you want to observe life cycles, bugs are the best way to go. And some species like the butterflies that many of you are raising um, can be released. Not all of them, but some of them. So you're now maybe thinking about bringing bugs into your classroom. All right, caterpillars, 
butterflies. Um, so it looks like probably about, uh, you know, a, a little more than half of you do bring bugs into your classroom. And I, I, I'm going to assume that most of them are through the butterflies and, and, and caterpillars. Now, there are lots of great kits out there and they are fantastic. Hold on, let me go back one. So, so this kit right here, the insect lore kits are fantastic. They give you a lot of really great information please, please, please read them and <laughs> read them carefully. Um, uh, caterpillars are very, very touchy animals to keep alive. And they have given you, these, these uh, kids have given you everything you need to, uh, to, to navigate that really thin window. Um, the important things from those, those, those kits is to make sure you choose a place that's appropriate in your classroom. It needs to be away from any vents, any drafts, and it needs to be as, as secure as any spot in your classroom because caterpillars are very, very delicate. And of course, we all know that when they become butterflies, they're even more delicate. So um, the, I, my best advice for keeping things like caterpillars and butterflies is, is to make sure you read those directions very, very carefully. Now, some of the kits don't come, most of the kits come with a butterfly feeder so that you don't have to release the butterflies right away. Um, usually it's like a little spongy thing. It looks like a flower most times because that's adorable. Um, if for some reason your kit does not come with them or you're not using a pre-made kit, making butterfly feeders are really, really easy. You can see I've got that picture there. Um, it's basically just a lid with some rocks and some sponges in it. You don't wanna fill up just a thing of water because the, the butterflies could actually really hurt themselves in sort of deeper water. Um, they like to perch and they, they use their proboscis, which is a straw-like um, mouth part to drink and they need something to sort of perch on to be able to do it. Really easy to do. This is also something you can do for wild butterflies. Setting up butterfly feeders like this with, um, you, can you can put it out for water and you can also make up a, a, a simple sugar solution. There's I'm, one of the resources that um, is on the um, write-ups for this webinar has some of those resources for you. So a simple sugar solution and some rocks and some sponges and you can feed wild butterflies too. So you can do it for your butterflies in your classroom and you can also do it for the butterflies that are visiting your schoolyard. So there's another alternative to caterpillars and butterflies. Caterpillars and butterflies are fantastic to watch that life cycle, but they are largely hands-off. And for those of you who might be a little squeamish about our bug friends, hands-off might be the way you want to go. But that also means that uh, generally speaking, uh, it's not great for the caterpillars or, or the butterflies to be handled by young children. So there is an alternative and that is mealworms. So mealworms, they go through a similar life cycle to caterpillars. They um, start off in a larva stage. It looks very similar to the caterpillars. They go through, um, they, they make a pupa, just like the chrysalis. And then there is an adult beetle that comes out at the end of it. Um, they're really very, very simple to care for. I, I do have some, um, hold on, I have a picture. Let me show, oh, here we go. So this picture down here, that is just the uh, oatmeal and a few little carrots in it. That is a mealworm habitat and it is perfect. Really, they just, they live inside oatmeal. Um, and uh, they're happy with carrots and sweet potatoes. They cannot be released the same way that butterflies can because darkling beetles could be a little invasive. But if you do have other classroom pets or you're an avid fisherman, you can use the mealworms to help feed your other critters to keep them happy. I, for one, actually do have some live um, mealworms that live at my house because I have chickens and my chickens love mealworms. So I keep a mealworm colony going all year long. Um, and actually I'm gonna show some of them right now. So I'm gonna switch over to my other camera and we're gonna meet some of my mealworms. All right, so what we're looking at here looks like a bowl of oatmeal <laughs> because it is largely a bowl, a bowl of oatmeal. But if I dig a little bit deeper, you can see I'm gonna come a little bit, let's see, whoops, let's see if I can come a little bit closer. For those of you who are squeamish, this may not, I don't, you may not wanna get closer, but let me see. All right, here we go. There we go, now we're a little bit closer. So you can kind of see them wiggling around in there. The advantage to these guys is that they can be held by um, your students because they cannot physically hurt your students. They don't have the mouth parts for it. Um, and they're pretty hardy, okay? So you can see them moving around here. 
All right, there they all are. There's, there's actually quite a few in here. And they make for a really fun addition to a uh, science center, especially when you're talking about living or non-living. Now, I, I was hoping that I would have some um, adult beetles to show you today, but they didn't cooperate. They didn't pupate fast enough, but I do have some really cute little mealworms to show you here. All right, oh, I just got, I got a question. If you can't release the beetles, what do you do with them when your classroom doesn't want them any longer? Well, if you do have animals that um, will eat them, the animals will also eat the, uh, will eat the beetles. Hold on, let me come back to my other camera so you can see my face and not just my cute little mealworms. There we go. Um, you can, you can, um, uh, give them to your other animals. If you're keeping a full colony, if you can, it can go all year long, your adult beetles will make more baby beetles. <laughs> so you don't ever have to buy mealworms again because they're always gonna keep producing baby mealworms, um, which is actually kind of exciting to see those, those grow as well. Um, and, but finally, uh, if, if you don't have someone to feed them to, if you don't wanna keep them any longer, um, you can um, uh, put them in the fridge and um, the, the, the beetles, beetles won't, won't be around anymore. Um, and then you can uh, uh, send them to, um, you can either uh, ask a, like local farms or other people who have pets if, if they wanna take those beetles off of your hands. Otherwise you can just dispose of them. All right, <laughs> so let's go back to my PowerPoint here. I am, I am particularly partial to mealworms and beetles. They're, they're my absolute favorite because they're self-sustaining and you can continue to watch them over and over again. It's not just a one and done like it is with caterpillars and um, students love interacting with the mealworms. Even the most squeamish student at the beginning of a, of a lesson um, usually will spend some time petting and touching and holding the mealworms. Um, and they're, they're just absolutely fascinating, fascinating and super easy to uh, take care of. And then the last bug is worms. So I don't know how many of you were with me when I did the all worms all the time presentation back in the summer. I love composting. Um, it is a very, very uh, forgiving activity you can do with your students. Um, and it can fit basically any sort of structure you have. Now, I'm not going to I'm not going to go step by step on composting here because there are already so many great resources out there. The uh, the um, write ups that you're going to get at the end of this presentation have fantastic resources, not only for in the classroom, but personal compost if you'd like if that's something you'd like to start doing. Um, I do want to share this story compost stew. It is a fantastic alphabet book all about what can and cannot go into a compost pile. It's adorable and it's fantastic for introducing the idea of composting. So the nice thing is, is that, like I said, it's very forgiving. You can, if you've got a lot of space, you can do um, a big compost, like a, just a Rubbermaid container, a big guy, or you can do it in something as small as a coffee grounds container. So those, those plastic um, uh, like folders containers are perfect. You can do mini composters very easily in that. You can do it inside or outside because as long as you don't overfeed your compost, it doesn't smell bad and it, 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 it should um, uh, work very, very quickly. Um, so you can either do it inside or outside depending on the space that you have. If you don't wanna add worms, if the worms are just a bridge too far, you can do it without worms. I do say that with, with worms, you, you, get le you get fewer smells, it goes a lot faster, and of course you get worms to play with. Um, and if you're already growing plants in your classroom, this is the perfect sort of starter activity. If you're gonna be growing plants in the spring, start your compost in um, you know, November to January. That way you're gonna get a nice rich compost and your plants are gonna go crazy in your classroom. It's a great way to get students thinking about sort of the life cycle beyond just planting the seed and watching it grow. This is also a great one to send home to parents. You may have parents in the classroom who are already doing this. Maybe they'd be willing to come in and share some of their experiences with it, share some of their worms if you don't want to start compost in your own um, classroom. Um, and then just really quick tips. You don't have worms, you gotta move it around a lot. If it's in a small container, you can shake it up. If it has worms, please don't shake it up. Those poor worms. Um, or, 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 or stir it with um, a stick that you only use for your compost. Um, don't add too much food. The kids get really excited and every single person wants to add their banana peel from lunch to the compost. 
that is how you get other bugs that you don't want in your compost. <laughs> so make sure that you're, you're very slowly adding those um, kitchen scraps and leaves and things like that so that we're not, we're, it's not overwhelming the compost and you end up with things like fruit flies or gnats. Um, and never put meat or um, processed sugar inside your compost. Uh, that, that sort of stuff just doesn't break down right and introduces bacteria that can be bad for your compost and, and bad to have sort of in your classroom. All right. <clears throat> Again, this is by no means a full picture of composting in your classroom, but we're sharing great, 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 great resources with you so that um, you'll be able to do it uh, successfully yourself. All right, say you have bugs in your classroom. You've decided to do caterpillars, you've got mealworms, you've got worms. What are some fun things you can do beyond watching those critters? Watching the critters is super fun. Uh, it is the best part of having them in your classroom. Um, but beyond that, how do, we, how do we extend the learning? So I wanted to share some like quick DIY um, uh, activities that you can add on to your existing curriculum. Okay, the first uh, is, is what I call a uh, uh, snack like a bug. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna actually put these, I'm gonna put all of these on my camera here. Again, you're gonna get write-ups for these in um, the, uh, the activities for this lesson. So uh, don't, don't, you don't have to scramble to write it down, but I do wanna show you a little bit what this looks like. Okay, so I'm gonna stop and come back to my camera. Here we go. All right, oh, there's my mealworms. Sorry, sorry. I, I told you we, we would be moving on from the mealworms and there they were staring at you in the face. All right, so the first is, um, this is a great uh, fine motor skills activity. So, oh, where did my leaf go? I used it for drawing and now it's gone. Oh no. It seems to have disappeared. So that little leaf that I had that I was drawing, oh, here it is, fantastic. That little leaf I was drawing, it had very specific holes in it, like it had been chewed on. It had not been chewed on. I had been using a hole puncher to punch holes in it. Having these out at your science center, um, you can use hole punchers like this. These tend to be very difficult to use, but if you've got those flat craft ones where you can push down on the button, those are great ones. Um, so the, the students can practice munching on leaves just like a caterpillar would. Um, different caterpillars eat different leaves. I um, like to use real fresh leaves for this activity. You can of course use paper leaves if you'd like, um, but there, there's something sort of uh, fun and sensory about using a real leaf and punching through it with the um, uh, uh, hole punch. Now, when you move up to butterflies, that's when you bring out your eyedroppers and your basting, um, your, your turkey basters to start sucking up liquids like uh, a butterfly would. Now, if you're talking about life cycle, I have what here looks to the naked eye like butterfly eggs. I love talking about butterfly eggs um, because uh, when you get the butterfly kits, you get them already as caterpillars. You don't tend to see the eggs. So we can look at pictures and we can look at videos, but what this is right here is just tapioca pearls. And these tapioca pearls have been soaked overnight in green food coloring and room temperature water. And they feel and look for all intents and purposes, just like a, a, a caterpillar egg. Now caterpillar eggs come in different colors, they come in different shapes, but this right here is a pretty good substitute for um, what caterpillar eggs really do look like. They're even a little bit sticky. Okay, you can see like they're sticking to my hand because that's really important when you're a caterpillar egg. You need to be able to stick to stuff because they're usually stuck on the undersides of leaves. So what I typically like to do um, with our students is just cut out little paper leaves and they can arrange their little sticky eggs on the leaf. And um, we can, we can um, I also like to include different color leaves and that starts a whole conversation about camouflage with your, um, with your eggs. Because when you're an egg, you can't defend yourself. You have to be able to blend in. So I like to bring out different colors of leaves and, and have the students hide those um, eggs on different colored leaves. It's a really, really cheap way to uh, look at this part of the life cycle that doesn't usually come with those kits. Now, <clears throat> The last activity I had on that list was buggy yoga. 
I, I, you must be disappointed, but I'm, I'm not going to do my buggy yoga right now. I actually, the first time I did buggy yoga with um, a student, I was eight and a half months pregnant. So uh, curling up like an egg, I was the funniest looking egg you've ever seen because I just I could not curl up like an egg. But this is a great activity to do um, when you're, you know, you're getting ready for nap time and everyone's sort of calming down. It's really just spending time in each of those stages um, uh, nice and quietly because as we all know, butterflies and caterpillars don't make a lot of noise. The only noise I like to make is a little bit of crunching when we're caterpillars and we're crunching on leaves. <laughs> Um, but after they've had an opportunity to watch some of these animals in person, uh, acting out each of those life cycles by moving their body around is a great way to sort of internalize the differences between eggs, larva, um, pupa, chrysalis, and of course the adult butterflies. All right, so we've seen some bugs. We've talked about bugs. I've shown you some ways to use them. Will you raise bugs in your classroom? Now, at the end of the session today, if you have any real burning questions about keeping bugs in your classrooms, um, I'll stick around and you can, you can uh, send them to me in the chat in the q and I'll be happy to answer them. I've raised all sorts of bugs. Bugs are my absolute favorite. I didn't even talk about my favorite bug. My favorite bug is cockroaches. Hissing cockroaches are my favorite classroom pets but I didn't even get into that today. But if you've got any questions about raising bugs in your classroom, please, please, please stick around and I'll, and I'll do my best to answer them. Or you can also send us an email and um, I'll, I'll try to do my best to answer those for you as well. All right, so now we're on to fiction books. So the nonfiction books, um, again, aren't so great for story time, but there are so many great uh, fiction books it for each of the seasons that you won't have any problems finding books for story time and book books for read aloud. Now, the, the thing that, you know, I, I'm a science educator. I was really, I, I have to, have to, have to um, look at the science and the content. Is it true and is it real? And are we, you know, are there, are there um, inaccuracies in any of the books? I'm here to tell you, it doesn't matter. Inaccuracies in books are not a problem. Now, if you don't know it's an inaccuracy, if, if, okay, if you know it's an inaccuracy, fix it. One of my absolute favorite um, uh, uh, books I used with, with, my, with some students is Was a Very Hungry Caterpillar. I'm sure we've all read it, um, but it's actually, it's, it's not correct. <laughs> it, it says that the caterpillar makes a cocoon at the end. So all I did was I took a little piece of paper and I wrote the word chrysalis on it and I taped it into my book and I didn't say anything about it. And every single student saw it, every single one. They would go through on their own and be like, why is this in here? And that's a fantastic, that they're never gonna forget that because it was so sort of out of the ordinary. Feel free to change it. If it's not right, change it. But if we're just sort of veering into the imaginative science realm, go for it. Some of the best conversations can come from using those fiction books and talking about how they can or cannot happen. All right, looks like we're, we're still pretty much split. People, aren't, people aren't, aren't feeling the bugs necessarily. But maybe, maybe after you've had some time to think about bugs in your classroom, uh, we'll have more converts at the end here. <laughs> okay, so these are some of my absolute favorite um, fiction books. Um, and, and some of them are great for lots of different reasons. These two, so I've got Errol's Garden and Lola Plants a Garden. I included these two books because they have um, representations of, of, of kids in them doing research, which is sort of a, a strange thing to see in a, in a children's book. Um, so, you know, Errol and, and his, and his grownups, um, they, they go to the internet and they try to find the best plants to grow and they, and they, you know, they have to, to figure out which plants will do well in the garden space that they have. And, and Lola does, does the same thing. And I, it's, I always like to point out when we see sort of these positive science behaviors in fiction books, um, because you won't see those in, in, in the, the content specific nonfiction books, um, but you, you can see characters sort of doing the right science thing. And that's really important for students to sort of see very early on. And then this is a book that I actually didn't know about until I started putting this, this webinar together. And it's called Sidewalk Flowers. Um, it's, it's largely um, uh, wordless 
there, there, there's not a lot to it, um, but there are beautiful pictures and it's a story of a, of a, of a child collecting sort of those sidewalk flowers, those flowers that grow in between um, uh, uh, the, the cracks in the sidewalk and um, how you can sort of make something beautiful from, from things that you may not think are beautiful at the beginning. And I love that it has um, sort of the map of the, of the real places that the author used to uh, inspire this story. So not only do we are we talking about finding nature in unexpected places of the story, but it's 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 sort of a true story because this author actually knows all the places that their characters visited, which could make a really great sort of jumping off point for a classroom book about a similar thing. And honestly, Hank's Big Day is just, it is just the sweetest thing. If you have not read it, it's a roly poly bug and you follow it across the course of its day and it is, just adorable and we've got this cute little girl here dressed up like Amelia Earhart the whole time it is delightful if you've not read it take a look okay now I don't know if you've seen these particular books before Christy Matheson has a whole series of interactive books now you've probably seen um Press Here which is a very very famous um interactive book these are more nature-based ones. And these are the two that I would suggest you look into for your spring um, uh, read alouds. They're fantastic. Basically, the student sort of takes on nature, the role of nature, and helps very small plants to grow and helps uh, plants go through the different seasons. So there are great opportunities for the whole class to, um, to physically think about how nature impacts sort of growing plants. Very fantastic. Check them out. They're also, they're also included on the um, resource list for this webinar. All right. And the last thing I want to talk about, if you're growing plants, you're probably already, you, you probably are growing some plants of some sort. Maybe you're growing grass. Maybe you're doing the, the beans where you stick them in a little baggie and they start to grow. Fantastic. What I want to spend a little bit of time um, on today is, is what you stick those plants in. All right. Um, now, you, you, you probably have already guessed I'm a big fan of bugs, I'm a big fan of dirt. Um, if you are not a, a, a fan of dirt, at the very end, I will talk about some neater ways to incorporate some of these ideas into your classroom. If you're if you uh, don't relish the idea of bringing dirt into your classroom. Um, but uh, so just just hang with me and I'll give you some non dirty ways of dealing with dirt. So um, Really quick, dirt is made up of four very important things. Rocks and minerals, that's most of the dirt. Air, it's the spaces between all the little bits of dirt. Water, healthy soil has to have water in it. And something called humus. Okay, now humus is all of the formerly living stuff in your soil. So it's leaves and sticks and roots and worm poop. Yep, uh, I know Leslie's not here with us today, but she always she always loves when I talk about poop in these webinars. And when I say loves, she tolerates me talking about poop in these webinars. And worm poop is a fantastic part of soil and it is part of what we call humus, not hummus, humus. It's a little different, you see we only got one M there. So let me show you some soil and the way that um, I do some dissecting of the soil with my students. So let me stop sharing. I'm gonna show you my dirt on my camera here. All right, so here we go. We've just got a nice little pile of dirt. This is dirt from my backyard. Um, it, I, I did grow some things in this. So you'll actually see there are some um, little bits of roots and things like that. Now there is nothing living in this soil. And I would suggest you do this, especially if you're gonna have students use their sense of touch to explore this dirt to make sure that there's nothing living in it and there's not um, uh, something that can be harmful to your students in the dirt that you're dissecting, make sure that you um, freeze your dirt. It's very simple. You just put your dirt inside a, a freezer safe bag and you leave it in there. If you really wanna be safe, you can leave it in there a week, but if you're strapped for time, two days is plenty. Um, just you know, make sure it's all sealed up, right? Do not eat on it just in case you have someone who might want to eat that dirt. Um, and that will kill anything in the soil that could potentially um, be dangerous for your students. Um, I also would suggest not using um, packaged soil because it has fertilizers built into it. And that specifically is something we don't want our students to come into contact with. Um, and then of course, you could, if, you're, if you're still concerned about um, sort of the contamination with the soil after you've frozen it and all of that stuff, um, you can always do these, um, 
you can do it inside a plastic bag. So they can um, sort of shake the dirt around and, and, and find things in a plastic bag, you even put it on top of your light table so you can see things a little bit better. Um, but once you've frozen it, it's, it's, it's perfectly safe for your students to sort of explore with their hands. So let's go back to our, to our dirt here. So you can see most of this black stuff here is just uh, rock, minerals, bits and pieces. Now, what I do do when I work with uh, kiddos is I add some bigger rocks. Um, you, like these rocks look very, very clean inside my soils because they weren't in there before. I added them so that we had more things to sort of sort. Um, so you, you see lots of rocks. Now to find air in your, um, in your rocks, what I typically do is I just have them move it around with their finger. And I said, you know, does it move? Can you, can you spread it out nice and thin so you can see the plate through it? What do you think is between all these tiny little pieces of, of rock and dirt here? And then eventually we get the idea that there's air in here. If there was no air, it would be one solid piece of dirt. But instead we're able to sort of move it around and that's evidence of air. And then for water, this is another sort of like sneaky bit. Um, I will spray the water. I, I will spray the soil with a with a spray gun before we um, before the students are exploring it, because you know it often dries out very very quickly. In fact, I sprayed this before the the seminar today, um, but it's already starting to dry out because you want it to be a little bit damp. Because if they can't feel it with their hands, they might be able to feel that it's it's moist and it's it's wet just by feeling it. But the sort of the best sort of test if there's water in it is to take a handful and squeeze it really hard. Now see, this is already dried out a little bit, so it's not working. But if you squeeze it really hard and it sticks together, we can talk about why does it stick together? And we talk about sandcastles. Sandcastles only stick together because when we add water to them. So that's how we can find out that there's water in it. And then lastly, humus. Now I've added some of these things. Now the roots were, were natural to it, but I've added little bits of stick and little bits of leaves. And those are all things that, that we can point to for humus. Now I've mentioned that I love these um, dry erase packets. I have mentioned it multiple times. Oh, oh, sorry, I put it over here. I love to use these for dissecting the dirt. So what I'm gonna do is, whoops, put it right underneath here. Cause again, we can wash this off because again, we're, we're, we're dealing with dirt. Whoops, don't have enough room. There we go. So we've got humus and I've got rock. So we can start taking things out of our soil and we can place them where they belong. Well, is this, was this living? Yeah, it was living, so now it's gonna go in humus. Now I can wipe this off when I'm all done and it helps me to sort these two things. You can try sorting air and water, um, but that's of course much more difficult. Those are better to observe than they are to necessarily sort. Okay, <sighs> coming up on time here. Let's finish talking about dirt and then we are all done for today. All right, again, I'm going to blow through the rest of the, the dirt conversation relatively quickly, but this presentation and um, the resources will be available afterwards um, for you to, to take a look at. You can do, you can do more with dirt. Um, you can compare different kinds of dirt and you can include things like kinetic sand, which doesn't act like dirt you would find outside. Um, you can weigh them at your science center. You can look at them with magnifying glasses, add drops of water. Sometimes the water will get sucked in and sometimes it will sit on top. These are all great explorations that are really fun um, to, to do with students. You can also fill a mason jar with each, oops, fill a mason jar with each of um, the types of soil, fill them up with water, shake them up, and then just let them sit. That's, a, that's an easy, no uh, contact way of exploring dirt. Um, and you'll notice that each different type of soil will have sort of a, a different sort of settling pattern, which, which is a lot of fun to, to experiment with. And of course, play with mud, freeze your mud, make art with your mud, build with your mud. What is dirt, what, what is mud if not dirt that has just gotten really wet? <laughs> so have fun with mud. Um, I, I'm not gonna spend too much, too much time on it here, um, but in the spring, things get muddy real fast. Now, for those of you who are afraid of using dirt because it's just dirty, I have, um, you can make your own sort of faux dirt. Um, there is this play dirt that is available. Now, of course, it won't have any of the other things. It would only have sort of the rock pieces, you know, the rocks and minerals and air. <laughs> um, I have not experimented adding water 
to those, but we can do the, the uh, test for water because it does stick together a little bit. You will need to add uh, humus to it though. You can add things like sticks and rocks, um, bigger rocks, and you can add um, real leaves or paper leaves to your, um, your, your faux dirt. Now, um, a couple of slides back, I had sort of the percentages. Most of it is rocks, uh, rocks and minerals, so you want to keep it there, and then add the other things accordingly. You could go completely off the grid and do, uh, you know, uh, all craft supply dirt. And even if you have real dirt, I would suggest doing this because it's a fun way to sort of talk about um, sort of those those uh, proportions of dirt. You've got to have all of them, but you've got to have more of one and less of the other. So it could be a neat way to visualize that piece of it. All right, last poll. How likely are you to experiment with dirt in your classroom? Ooh, I see lots of people loving dirt. Fantastic news. All right, while you are finishing that up, here we are, we've made it. <sighs> One minute to go and we did it. Kathy, are you there? So you can see the, the, throughout the presentation, I had the little bees on stuff, but there are some other uh, fantastic products that are available uh, at shopbecker.com. Anything you wanna say about this particular slide, Ms. Ms. Kathy? So these, like Holly just said, these items and some others that you'll see in the resources that we will share um, after the webinar are in, uh, you know, check our website out, shop shopbecker.com. And these would be great, you know, additions to your classrooms. Yeah, and, and they, uh, you can also find those dry erase packs, the ones that I use for literally everything um, because they're washable uh, there as well. And then we've got the seasonal science set, many of the books that I talked about. So uh, we, I, and you saw these, I know in our uh, earlier uh, seasonal webinars, but these are so, a great collection of science books that are just, you know, across the seasons. Um, and then some additional ones that you might want to think about for adding spring. And then also some books for insects and spiders um, and gardens and trees. So check out these uh, book sets at shopbecker.com. All right, oh, and then we've got the kitchen science. Uh, brand new, brand new item uh, based off of uh, Holly's kitchen science webinars. <laughs> so the webinars were, were such a great um, hit that Becker's, uh, Leslie and Holly were able to design these uh, kits for you with some cards that help you think about different science experiments with your kids in the classroom. Um, so these, again, they're available. They are fresh, hot off the press. <laughs> um, so check out, again, our website, shopbecker.com and check out the kitchen science sets. Some great, great books. Again, I love books. So those are fantastic. And there's another interactive book in there that Mix It Up um, is a fantastic interactive book to include. And we made and it. And one more. So we've got three seasons down. We've got one more left and my favorite season. So the summer seasonal science webinar is scheduled for May 20th at 4 p.m. So, uh, you know, check your email. You'll be getting a link um, to register for that. And again, it's just going to be a great way to, you know, end all our webinars about, sci about science and seasons. And <laughs> yeah, there we are. Okay. Right. So, and there, and also uh, watch your um, email for an upcoming webinar um, with Barry Coral during the week of the young child. So the week of the young child from the National Association for the Education of Young Children. Um, this year is April 10th to the 16th. And on Wednesday, April 14th, we're having a special webinar um, with Barry Coral and many of you are uh, probably familiar with her. Um, and she'll be doing some mindfulness activities with us. Um, peaceful parents, teachers, and children. Awesome. So, 
now, now I know a, a lot of you uh, have to have to leave and have to, to run out. So thank you for so much for spending time with me today. Um, I, I do see there are some uh, questions uh, in the uh, Q&A and I'll try to answer a few of them. Otherwise, I hope to see you for summer. We're gonna talk all about the water cycle and doing cool water experiments in your classroom and then some other sort of fun summer activities to include. So we'll get that to you in May. So you'll have plenty of time to prep for your for your summer months. Right, so we will stick around for anybody who has questions and how we will answer them. Um, thank you for everyone for joining us this afternoon. Thank you to the Becker's team for answering those questions um, and keeping us all informed about where we can find some of the, the products. Look for an email in uh, 24 to 48 hours with all these resources, a recording of the webinar and your, your professional development certificate. And we hope to see you again back in April. <laughs> Holly, thank you again. Um, thank you for sharing your mealworms. Uh, we're gonna have to talk about your favorite bugs um, at another time because another time. I, I have a few concerns about that, but that's okay. Um, so you're you're slowly getting me onto your all right, side. All right, all right, all right. I'll work on it. Um, so I had a question about the uh, materials I used for the for the bird's nest, um, the whisk activity. Uh, those acti those in in large quantities of of course they would they would be bad for the for for sort of an environment, but in the quantities where the, the birds are using it in their uh, nests, squirrels will also use it too. It is perfectly safe for them to use. If you have natural yarn, use it. If you don't, if you're using acrylic yarn, that's also fine. The quantities in which the birds will be using it, they'll still stick to mostly things like leaves and sticks. Um, will be perfectly fine and um, uh, safe for the birds. Now I got a lot of questions on mealworms, which I am um, I'm very very excited to see. Um, so I have mealworms in these this this uh, the oatmeal. Uh, other things you can keep them in. It's it's oatmeal is the cheapest. You can also use uh, chicken feed. So um, crumbles that you would feed to a chicken is another sort of nutritious substrate for our uh, mealworms to live in. Um, they don't need a lot of water as long as you keep sort of moist food in their um, uh, their colony. You don't need to water them or mist them or do any of the things you would do with with other invertebrates. As long as you keep them supplied in nice juicy um, sweet potatoes or carrots, um, that's really all the moisture they need to sort of grow up and pupate and become uh, beetles. So there are uh, places to buy worms. The the internet is filled with them. Um, I know here in in the um, in the in the northeast, I I tend to get all of of my worms from um, uh, a, a supplier called Uncle Jim, <laughs> and he's got he's got worms for composting as well as mealworms. So you can you can look them up online. Um, but there are plenty of providers throughout the country who will live ship uh, worms like mealworms or even compost worms right to you. Um, so I meant it's about tapioca for the eggs, uh, just a grocery store. Yep, if you just look at the grocery store um, and uh, you can uh, uh, use the tapioca pearls, uh, right, that, that you would use to make tapioca pudding. Um, all right, stick around for another minute or two. Great. Now we know you also have chickens. Yes, I do. <laughs> Add that to your repertoire. Right. Um, there is some concern about the strings and, and yarn. Um, of course, you know, follow your heart with these sorts of things. Um, but with with uh, the amount again that you'd be using in your in your your um, playground area. Um, Generally, uh, you know, we've used them very successfully um, with other schools in the past. So follow your heart though. You can also use more natural supplies. They're harder to see when they've been used. Things like dog hair and lint from your um, uh, dryer um, are also sort of more natural materials to use. We are going to stop the recording, but we are gonna stay on. If you still have questions, you can go ahead and continue to ask them of Holly.
And again, thank you for joining us. And thank you to the Beckers team for all your hard work this afternoon. And for Holly and her bug friends. My bug friends. <laughs>